I am your host, Titus Suetonius Trajanus, Decanus for the Midwestern Contiburnium for Legion 14 Gamina. In this episode, we are going to do a cold weather kit march. All right, here's some of the areas I'll be hiking as we trek down here. There's snow on the ground from yesterday. I'll be crossing that bridge down there if I can get a good view of it. There's a huge canyon. Um, Okay, so I'm about to hike this morning. I will be doing a full kit march. Um, it is currently 19 degrees in Star Rock State Park where I'm hiking. Uh, I've got my full kit. Um, I'm gonna try to take some video and pictures while I'm out there. I don't know how long my phone will last in this cold, uh, but this is just experimental archaeology. We know the Romans mostly wintered in the winter time, but they would have traveled between forts, possibly done guard duty and all such things. So the Romans in Germany and in Britain would have been exposed to cold weather. Uh, it is a fact, and we. The only thing I'm really concerned about is possibly my hands, and actually when I go out in the cold and get my armor laced up and everything. But once I get moving, we'll see how everything goes. Okay, I've made it quite a ways. Um, I'm actually quite warm, so doing well. The kit's holding up well. Um, made it to that bridge I videoed earlier in the car, so I'm gonna set this camera up and try to get some better shots of me. I've been out here for a solid 45 minutes. I've been marching. I haven't got cold at all. This uh, arm wrap thing I rigged up is not holding up well at all. But I have a sleeve here of linen. So a long sleeve tunic would be a nice wise and back. These panulas are incredibly warm. They have great coverage. But you're going to want a little tie. Uh, and leg wraps. I'm definitely a wool tunic. I'm wearing three tunics. I have an under tunic. I have a linen tunic and a wool tunic. Things I do have wool mittens. They're my camera rest right now. The, the leg wraps are holding up incredibly. My legs are sweating underneath them. I have two pairs of null binding socks on and uh, cow tie. So that helps. This canola has incredible coverage. Pull it down, and pull it down. And the hood can even go over the helmet. Something that was incredibly picked out today at Weekend March is the strap over the dual strap for the back. So this literally was thrown around my neck and it I have it so it's right where I would carry it on the grip. So if I get tired I can let go of the handle and either push it to my back or hold it with my hand while most of the weight is on this. So that was a great experimental archaeology thing today. This kit march is going so much better, even though I have way more kit on because of the cold. But I'm still in the Hello and welcome to the Experimental Archaeology Lab. We are going to go over some of the stuff that we learned out in the field. The first off is what we learned with the system that a lot of us in the Legion have been using over the last few months and that is d-rings attached right behind the boss with straps some people have adjustable straps i just had these 
with my goal to eventually get adjustable straps. Now, this system of rigging, um, especially hard with a, a Sagon, and that is not as bad with a Hamada, but you are still fighting trying to get it up to the shoulders is where ideally you want to carry it. Now, looking at me right now, it looks pretty good. When you march on flat ground, it's fine. Now, what I found myself doing a lot of was pulling these up and holding like that to get the scoot to about shoulder height. Uh, so that way the back of your legs do not hit the bottom of the scootum while you're marching, which becomes a real problem. Getting the scootum off your back with this setup, right now I'm in soft kit, so in full kit it's a little more difficult trying to fight when you have, if you have your furca pull water bottle, every other piece of equipment on, helmet, armor, um, but you can undo the arms, which even here with soft kit, it's, you're trying to get it down. Marching like that in enemy territory would be completely illogical because it would be hard to access your scooter. So we rigged up a new system uh, that I briefly showed while out on the march, but I'm going to show you in detail here in the experimental archaeology lab. So these were rigged up pretty simply. Uh, they were just kind of uh, slipknot tied together so we can remove these um, easily off the D-rings. That was part of the way I installed them. This strap uh, was made by one of our members. So you come up from the bottom like this with the strap. I take it to its tightest setting. You can put it around you and then tighten it as it's around you. When I'm wearing a soft kit like this, it's not very difficult to throw over my head. Now, if I'm wearing my helmet, yes, that's when it becomes a problem. So it's easier to just throw the strap over your shoulder, pull it and tighten it up. Hold it like that. Now, you can put, rig it up to where the strap is right on your chest like that. The good thing about this sat perfectly on my sag and the sag carries the weight which is padded underneath with a super malice. So you can see how this rides on the back. It's about even with the shoulders. This is as tight as the belt goes currently because I haven't punched any new holes. Uh, I can, if I'm going downhill or something, kick the back of my legs into this. I prefer it up about even with the shoulders. This is where it would be with a sag or hamada on. Now, the great thing about this system, I marched three miles through tough terrain on my cold weather kit march, which you've seen earlier already in this video. I'm marching in hostile territory. Bam, here we go, just like that. Now the shield is right in front of me. So you can carry the shield like this, arms free. It's right where you want it, right under the armpit, right here. You can, I marched basically steadying it with my hand, moving it out in when I needed to, but most of the weight is on the shoulder. This is the heaviest thing you will carry on your kit. Yes, the fur pull is heavy. It's not as awkward. This shield makes the scooter, makes the world of difference. If it's rigged up properly, it works absolutely phenomenal. I want to go from carrying it here to my back, simply slide it around like this. There it is, back on the back. I want it around front, I push it like that. I want to tighten it, I pull this strap. I am in combat, and this thing is getting in the way, which it doesn't, I will show you. It, for combat, when it's tightened up here, is you can't lower the shield. I can pull this up, immediately loosen the strap. There, the strap's loose, now that's free. I want to tighten the strap, I pull it right up like that. Tighten it up, there we go. My personal thoughts would be for combat that you wouldn't want this strap on there, but for marching, and it's so easy to slip off for combat, but you can still put it up above your head, but this system worked absolutely great. There you go. It's already to my back. I want it around front. I'll show you again. You can do it with one hand if possible. Um, I mean, for example, you carry in your pelum or your furca pull, you switch hands with those, you can push it around with this hand, then bam, you're right back to this hand. Now I will tell you some evidence from archaeology. 
We know reliefs from Adam Cleesey show auxiliary soldiers, which we presume to be auxiliary soldiers, marching in line like this with their shields. They have a strap going to the side. It looks like it could be a scabbard down here, but I believe it's a ring like this because we don't see much evidence for common soldiers wearing their swords on the left side, especially in the first century. I've seen evidence on cavalry reliefs, Adam Cleesey for sure. Um, Trajan's column, they're carrying their shields here. They're carrying their helmets on the right breast, right over, looks like over their neck. They're also carrying their shields on the back. We don't see the rigging system really well on Trajan's column. Many of us in this legion have decided to take the route of experimental archaeology. Not looking at pictures and seeing what works, not just looking at archaeological evidence, what it's produced to see what works, but actually trying it in the field. So we take a combination of those three, we try it in the field. What we see on reliefs, what, we, what they've actually been found and discovered that we know exists, and putting those to work in the field. The whole goal of these experimental archaeology videos and series is to try things that we know exist in the field and to try what works. Please like, comment, subscribe, share this video, and let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you in the next episode.